Welcome to Innovate Training. My name is Carol Bajot, and I'm your instructor for this course. This course is titled Understanding HIPAA for the Medical Office, and this is our third lesson, The Security Rule Explained, Part 1. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, first we're going to talk about the need for physical and electronic safeguards of electronic protected health information, or otherwise EPHI. We're also going to talk about the basics of the administrative safeguards, physical safeguards, and technical safeguards of EPHI. We're also going to identify the role of the HIPAA security officer as the one responsible for local training and enforcement of HIPAA standards. So let's talk about what the security rule addresses. The security rule addresses the issue of keeping electronic protected health information from unauthorized disclosures. To ensure privacy, there must be high levels of security measures in place. Now, as we discussed in the previous lesson, we talked about the privacy rule. That indicates what information is to be protected. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the security rule and how it dictates how it's to be protected. Next, we'll talk about the security officer. In a small organization, this role may be played by the HIPAA officer or the privacy officer that we talked about in earlier lessons. However, in a large organization, the HIPAA officer may appoint a security officer. This person is responsible to administer and manage security compliance. This person is also responsible to take a gap analysis or perform a gap analysis. What is a gap analysis? A gap analysis is a report on the difference between where the entity stands as far as their security and where they need to be. And they're responsible, the security officer is responsible to make recommendations for changes and see to it that those changes are made. Let's first define the word access. Access is considered to be the exposure necessary to read, write, modify, or communicate information. Access privilege is what allows an individual to enter a computer system for an authorized purpose. Restricting access to only those persons and entities with a need for access is a basic tenet of security. What is data integrity? Well, security also means protecting the integrity of data systems protecting data from unauthorized alterations. So imagine the damage that can be done by someone who enters into a system and corrupts the data. Uh, changes financial data, for instance. They go into somebody's financial records and change the balances on people's accounts. They may alter a patient's medical record, changing the diagnosis or changing uh, particular facts about the treatment. Well, you might ask why someone might like to do something like this. But stranger types of crimes have been committed. Perhaps some young hacker with too much time on his or her hands. There are four areas of safeguard that must be addressed. Each entity must comply with the security ruling in four core areas. Number one, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all electronic protected health information they create, receive, maintain, or transmit. While the privacy rule sets the standards for disclosure and usage of health information, the security rule covers the move to electronic health information. Number two, protecting against anticipated uses or disclosures of electronic protected health information that are not permitted or required under the privacy rule. There are many stories of computer hackers who access databases containing personal information of all kinds, and hackers break in for many reasons. And sometimes there don't necessarily have to be reasons. Sometimes a hacker thinks of it as a challenge, and so to break into a system is accomplishing some type of challenge. So who wants this information anyway? Well, perhaps a disgruntled employee who may want to misuse health information to discredit a co-worker or a supervisor, an estranged marriage partner, jealous or greedy family members. Perhaps a business associate can try to access information 
on his or her business partner. Or a celebrity's private health information may be a tempting tidbit for a tabloid newspaper. There are many reasons that people want to break in and access this information. Number three of the four core areas. Protecting against any anticipated threats or hazards to the security, survivability, and integrity of electronic protected health information. Think about Hurricane Katrina that happened some years ago. It's an example of what can happen when medical records are destroyed by natural disasters. Many of the records that were in the hospitals and the medical systems in those areas were not backed up, and so they were lost forever. Now with electronic protected health information and HIPAA security rule, this information must be protected and preserved. Number four, workforce security. Ensuring compliance with the security rule by their workforce. Is the workforce trained in HIPAA? Is the workforce monitored in a way to track access to information? Now we've had a couple incidences in the news where a famous person's health information was accessed and then sold to a tabloid. Now some of these people were caught because their username was attached to an entry. And these particular people did not have any business purposes for accessing that inf information. In other words, they worked at the site, they worked at maybe the hospital or the billing site, but they were not assigned to that particular account, but they accessed it anyway. And so it was traced to them by having their username t attached to that particular entry. So let's talk about what a user is. This is a person with authorized access to the computer system. Passwords are a type of security that uses a confidential alphanumeric string that is used in conjunction with the username to verify the identity of an individual attempting to gain access to a computer system. Any person who accesses in an authorized manner must have a username and must use a password. There are three types of safeguards pertaining to the security rule. Number one is the administrative safeguards. These are the organizational requirements or the policies, procedures, and the documentation of, of those policies and procedures that re require certain procedures in order to access private health information. Number two are the physical safeguards. These are the things such as the locks and the doors and the safes and the computer systems that don't allow access. Number three are the technical safeguards. These are the things such as the usernames and the passwords and the other types of firewalls that prevent unauthorized access. So let's first talk about the administrative safeguards. The Department of Health and Human Services sets the standards but does not specify how to comply. The security rule mandates that each entity appoint someone to be responsible for securing electronic protected health information, and that's the security officer we mentioned earlier. Administrative safeguards also require the management of employees in relation to protected health information. Well, that's as we talked about earlier. This is where people who have access must have a username and a password. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or otherwise CMS, will ask to see procedures and policies regarding the following areas. Security management, assigned security management, information access, security awareness and training, security incidents, contingency plans, evaluation of security effectiveness, and business associate contracts. Security management. This involves implementing policies and procedures to prevent, detect, and contain any intrusion of security. The security officer is to conduct and maintain a risk analysis of the provider's organization. Before a provider can comply with the security rule, they need to know where the threats are to their electronic protected health information. HIPAA's requirements of security. The, secu the security rule is based on the fundamental concept of flexibility, scalability, and technology neutrality. Therefore, no specific requirements for types of technology to implement are identified. What this means is the security rule allows for differences in entity size and budget for security measures. While one entity 
may be able to afford an iris scan interface, another smaller entity may need to use a lock and key system because of their budget and their lack of the funds to afford such an expensive system. When performing a risk analysis, there are some important questions to ask. Who is able to view what information? Are there limits to the amount of information accessed by employees? Is it kept to a minimum necessary? Remember the minimum necessary clause we talked about in the last session. Is there opportunity for the public or patients to view electronic protected health information other than their own? What is the impact if data cannot be recovered? What if it were sent to the wrong party? What policies are in place to retrieve and remedy this type of accidental disclosure? How could it be altered in an unauthorized manner? Could someone tamper with the data? Workforce Security The security officer is responsible to maintain a record of access authorizations. They must ensure that personal op personnel operating and maintaining data have proper authorization maintaining a record of access authorizations as well. The security officer must ensure that personnel operating and maintaining data have proper access authorization. Other things that can be done are removing a name from a list after access is no longer needed, turning in keys, access list, or removing user accounts, and so forth after employment has been terminated. Information Access Management Consistent with the Privacy Rule Standard, limiting uses and disclosures of protected health information to the minimum necessary. The Security Rule requires a covered entity to implement policies and procedures for authorizing access to electronic protected health information only when such access is appropriate based on the user's or recipient's role. The people accessing the celebrities' information we talked about a few slides ago, was not, they were not assigned to that particular account. So therefore, they had no business or no appropriate base for having access to that information. Usernames and passwords. The security officer must ensure that each employee has an individually identifiable username and password. For login monitoring, a username tagged and dated at each point of access in order to perform a trace must be in place. Access is monitored and recorded. This allows tracking as well as provides an audit trail to determine where unauthorized access occurred. The security officer is responsible for a workforce plan which includes authorization and supervision. We talked about that earlier, monitoring the access of work, the workforce. Workforce clearance procedures. Are backgrounds checked? Termination of employment procedures. What happens when employment is terminated? Is database access immediately removed? What about keys and parking passes? Are security codes changed right away? Workforce training. A covered entity must train all workforce members regarding its security procedures and policies. They must have and apply appropriate sanctions against workforce members who violate its policies and procedures. Many companies have a packaged training program that all new employees must complete. Sanctions can be implemented for those employees who do not comply with, these, with such training. What about security incidents? A security incident is defined as an attempted or successful unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction of information in an information system. An information system, by the way, includes the hardware, software, information, data, applications, communications, and the people that are involved in the system. So what happens when a breach of security occurs? Does the security officer implement investigations into what happened? And are those investigations well documented? So how does an entity respond to a security incident? The HIPAA security rule mandates that there be a formal documented response ex executed and a written report filed. 
reports must be included in the medical records of each affected individual. In other words, each individual account in which the breach occurred. All patients must be notified in writing of the incident and must be notified that their information was accessed and that notification must be documented. HIPAA mandates that the covered entity responds to the breach in a way that would remedy the breach in security. Patients have a right to know if their information had, has had an unauthorized access. So in summary, while the privacy rule mandates that the patient's information is kept confidential, the security rule takes the next step by indicating the steps needed to ensure this information is kept secure. Administrative safeguards are the policies and procedures that ensure the entity maintains an environment of trust between the provider and the patients. Well, I hope you enjoyed and benefited from this lesson, The Security Rule Explained, Part 1. Today we talked mostly about the administrative safeguards. In the next lesson, we'll go further into this subject in The Security Rule Explained, Part 2. We'll talk more about the physical and technical safeguards that are required. So please be sure to take the assessment quiz as those questions are helpful in preparing you for the HIPAA final exam. This is Carol Peugeot from Innovate Training, and I'll see you in next lesson.